A Watcher by the Dead by Amrose Rice. One. In the upper room of an unoccupied dwelling in a part of San Francisco known as North Beach lay the body of the man under a sheep. The hour was near nine in the evening. The room was dimly light, lighted by a single candle. Although the weather was warm, two windows contrary to the custom, which gives the dead plenty of air, were closed and blinds drawn down. Furniture the room consisted of but three pieces. Armchair, a small reading stand supporting the candle, a long kitchen table supporting the body of the man. All these, as also the corpse, seemed to have been recently brought in. Reserva had been one. Would have been that all were free from dust, whereas everything else in the room was pretty thickly coated with it. There were cobwebs at angles of the walls. <clears throat> Under the sheet, the outlines of the body could be traced, even the features, have these belonging, have these having a natural sharp definition, which seems to belong to faces of the dead, but is really characteristic of those only that have been wasted by disease. The silence of the room, one would rightly have inferred that it was not in the front of the house, facing the street, it really faced nothing but a high breast of rock, the rear of the building being set into a hill. A neighbouring clock, church clock was striking nine with an indolence which seemed to imply such indifference to the flight of time that one could hardly help wondering why it took the trouble to strike at all. Single door of the room was open. Men entered, advancing toward the body. As he did so, a boil closed, apparently, of its own violation. There was a grating of a key turned and dipped with difficulty, a snap of a locked door, locked bolt, as it shot into a rock, into a pot socket. The sound of retiring footsteps in a passage outside ensued. A man was all, to all appearance a prisoner. Fancy and Toby stood a moment looking down at the body, then with slight struggle of shoulders walked over to one of the windows and hoisted the blind. Darkness aside was absolute, the panes were covered with dust. But by wiping this away, he could see the window was fortified. The strong iron bars crossing in it within a few inches of glass embedded in the masonry at each side. His only other window was the same, he manifest no great courtesy in the matter. But did, but did not even so much as raise the sash, for as he was a prisoner, is apparently a tra- tractable one. Having completed his examination, the room he seated himself in the armchair, took a book from his pocket, drew the stand with the candle alongside, and began to, to read. The man was young, not more than thirty, dark in complexion, smooth shaven with brown hair, his face was thin, and the high nose with a broad forehead, and firmness of the chin and jaw, they said, by those having to denote definition, resolution. The eyes were grey and steadfast, not moving set with definite purpose, but now, for the greater part of the time, fixed upon his book, the cagey drew them and turned them to the body on the table, not apparently from any dismal fascination, which, under such circumstances, would might be supposed as exercise, Upon such a courageous person, nor the conscious rebellion against the country influence which might dominate a timid one. He looked at it as if his feeling he had come upon something calling him to sense his surroundings. Cadius watcher by the dead was discharging his trust with intelligence and composure. As composure as, beca- as become himself. After reading for perhaps half an hour, he seemed to come to the end of the chapter and quietly led, laid away the book. He rose and, taking the reading stand for the wind floor, carried it to the corner for the room, near one of the windows, lifted the candle from it, returned to the empty fireplace for which he had been sitting. A moment later, he walked over to the body on the table, lifted the sheet and turned it back from the head, exposing a mass of dark hairs, Thin face cloth beneath 
which the features showed an even sharper definition than before. So he had been posing his free hand towards him, between him and the candle. He stood looking at his motionless companion, a serious and tranquil regard, satisfaction from it with inspection. He pulled his sheet over the face again, turned in chair, but put some matches off, took some matches off the candle stick, put them inside pocket with his tack coat, and sat down. Then lifted his candle from his socket, and looked at it critically, as if calculating how long it would last. Barely two inches long. Now that alley would be in darkness. He placed it in the candlestick and blew it out. Two. The physician's office in Kearney Street. Three men sat about a table, drinking punch and smoking. Late in the evening, about midnight. Indeed, there had been no lack of punch. Gravest of these three, Dr. Hibbert Bernson, was the host. He was in his room as they sat. He was about 30 years of age. The others were even younger. All were physicians. Superstitious awe with which the living would guard the dead, said Heberson, is heredity and incurable. One needs to be more ashamed of it than the f- of the fact that he inherits, for example, the capacity for mathematics or a tendency to lie. The others laughed. Ought the man to be ashamed to lie, said the youngest of the three. In fact, a medical student and not yet gra- graduated. My dear Harper, I said nothing about that. The tendency to lie is one thing. Lying lying is another. But do you think, said the third man, that this is superstitious feeling, this fear of the dead, reasonless as we know it to be, is universal? I myself am not conscious of it. Oh, um, but it is, it, is, it is in your system for all that, replied Henderson. It needs only the right conditions. What shape may cause of confederation season? It manifests itself in every, in some very disagreeable way. A look will open your eyes. Physicians and soldiers, of course, more readily free from it than others. Physicians and soldiers, why don't you, you add hangmen and headsmen? No, let us have all the assassin classes. No, my dear Mencher. The juries will not let the public executions acquire significant familiarity with death be altogether moved by it. Don Harper, who had been helping himself to fresh cigar at sideboard, resumed his seat. What would be you consider conditions under which any man or woman born would become supportedly conscious of his share of our common weakness in this regard, he asked, rather verbosely. Well, I should say that if a man were locked up all night with a corpse, alone in a dark room, a vacant house, no bed covers to pull over his head, and lived through it without going altogether mad, he might justly boast himself not of a woman born, not yet like Mud McGruff, a product of Cosinian statue. I thought you never w- would finish pulling, putting up conditions at Arbor. By now a man is neither a physician or soldier who has set, who has set them all for the, any state you, you like to define. Who is he? His name is Jarrett, a stranger here. Comes from my town in New York. I have no money to back him. But he will back himself with lots of it. How do you know that? He would rather eat than bet. As you fear, I dare say he thinks it would be it's some kind of cartilaginous disorder, or possibly particularly kind of religious hearsay. But he, what does he look like? Heberson was only becoming interested. I ain't much of here. Might be twin brother. I set the children, said Heberson promptly. Awfully obliged to you for the compliment I've sure to all it. Dawdled, Merchant, who was growing sleepy. Can't I get into this? Not against me, Henson, Heberson said. I don't want your money. All right, said Muncher. I'll be with the, co- I'll be the corpse. Heberson laughed. They had not come with this crazy conversation that we have seen. Free and distinguishing his meager doubts. The candle, Mr. Durant's object, was to preserve it against some obscene need. You may not have a fault to, or half fault, and the darkness would be no worse at time than another. The situation became insupportable. It would be better to have a means of relief, uh, or release, in release. At any rate, it's wise to have a little reserve of light, even if only we able him to look at his watch. As soon as he blown out the candle, he set it on the floor at his side, he settled himself comfortably in the armchair, leaned back, closed his eyes, hoping expecting to sleep. In this is the appointment. 
He never in his life felt less sleepy. A few minutes he grew without the attempt. But what could he do? Could not go groping about in the absolute darkness at risk of burrows himself, risk too bumbling against the table, rudely disturbing the dead. Oh, he all recognised their right to lie at rest, immunity from all that is harsh and violent, dread, almost seemed to make himself believe the considerations of this kind restrained him from risking collision and fixed him to the chair. A thing in this matter, he fancied that he heard a faint sound in the direction of the table. What kind of sound could Holly have explained? He did not turn his head. Why should he? In the darkness, he listened. Why should he not? And listening, he grew giddy and grasped the arms of the chair of support. The strange ring in his ears. His head seemed bursting. His chest was oppressed by the constriction of his clothing. He wondered why it was so, and whether there was a symptom of fear. Then, with a long and strong expiration, his chest appeared to collapse, and the great grasp from which he really filled his extensive lungs of vertigo left him. He knew him so intently, he listened, that he held his breath almost to suffocation. The revelation was vexatious. He rose, pushed away the chair with his feet, his foot, strode to the centre of the room, but one does not stride far in the darkness. Can the grope but finding the wall windows near another corner came to violent contact with the reading stand, overturning it, made a crack and it started him. He was annoyed. How the devil I could have I forgotten where it was. He murmured and broke his way along the third wall to the fireplace. I must put things to rights, said he, feeling feeling the floor of the candle. Recovered that, he lighted it, instantly turned his eyes to the table, where naturally nothing had undergone any change. But he then lay unobserved upon the floor. He had forgotten to put it to rights. He looked about all the room, dispersing the darker shadows of by movements, the candle in his hand. Pressing over the door, tested it by turning and pulling the knob with all his strength. He did not yield his scene to afford him certain satisfaction. Indeed, he secured it more firmly by bolt, which he had not already, not before, observed. Turning his chair, he looked at his watch. It's half past nine. Start surprise. He held the watch at his ear. He had not stopped. The candle was now visibly shorter. He again extinguished it, placing it on the floor at his side as before. Mr. Nett did not, was not at ease, so he's deeply dissatisfied. His surroundings, with himself for being so. What have I to fear? He thought. It's ridiculous and disgraceful. I will not be a good, so good of great a fool. My courage does not come with saying. I will be courageous, nor recognise it properness for the occasion. The lawyer direct condemned himself. The more reason gave himself for accommodation. Condemnation. A greater number of variations. He played upon the simple theme of harmlessness. The dead. The more he was supported, grew the discord of emotions. Mr. what he cried aloud in anguish of spirit. What shall I have out of the shade of superstition in my nature? I have no belief in mortality. I am I am who never more clearly than now. The afterlife is a dream of desire. Shall I lose a, once my bet, my honour, my self-respect, perhaps my reason? Because certain savage ancestors dwelling in caves and barrels can see the monstrosity of the notion. Dead walk by night, that drained sickly mistakenly, the giant heard behind him. A soft sound, light like soft sound, footfalls, deliver a regular successfully nearer. Four. Just before the daybreak, the next morning, Dr. Hemmerson, his young friend Harper, were driving slowly through the streets of North Break Beach. The doctor's coupe, and he still the confidence of youth and the courage of solidarity. Your friend, said the older man, do you believe that I, that I have lost his wager? I know you have, replied the other, in feebly emphasis. Well, upon my soul, I hope so. He spoke earnestly, almost solemnly. There was a silence for a few moments. Harper, the doctor resumed, looking very serious and shifting half lights that entered the carriage as they passed the street lamps. 
I don't feel altogether comfortable about this business. If your friend has not irritated me by a contemptuous manner, which he treated any doubt, my doubt of his endurance as pure physical quality, by cold sensibility of suggestion, cult be that of physician, I should not have gone on with it. If anything should happen, we are ruined, and I fear we deserve to be. What could happen, even if the matter should be taken to a serious turn, of which I would not, I'm not at all afraid. Much is only to restrap, restrate himself, plain matters, a genuine subject for the detective room, of one of your late patients. It might be difficult. Dr. Mercer had been as good as his promise. He was the corpse. Dr. Mercer was silent for a long time in the carriage, a snail place, crept along the strange street that it travelled two or three times already. Presently he spoke, well, let's hope that Mercer is, if he had to rise from the dead, been discreet a mistake which might make matters at worse instead of better. Yes, said Hopper. Jeanette would kill him, but Doctor, look at his watch. It's a carried past the gaslamp. It's nearly four o'clock at last. A moment later, two had quitted the vehicle and were walking briskly towards a long, occupied house belonging to the Doctor, which they immured not Mr. Brett, according to the terms of the mayor manager. They neared at, at it and they met a man running. Can you tell me quite suddenly, speak, checking speed. Well, I can find a doctor. What's the matter, Edison asked the non committal. Go and see for yourself, said the man, as their means running. They hastened on. By the house, they saw several persons entering haste and excitement. In the same, some of the dwellings nearby across the way, a chamber of windows were thrown up, showing a protrusion of heads. All heads were asking questions, none heeding the questions of the others. A few of the windows were closed, blinds were eliminated. The inmates of these rooms were threatening to come down. Exactly opposite door of the, of the house, they sought the street lamp, a drew yellow, insignificant light upon the scene, seeming to say they would, could, could have closed a good deal more than it, if it wished. However, paused at the door and laid a hand on the arm. It's all up for, 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 for us, Doctor, he said, extreme agitation. We've contrasted strangely with his free and easy words. Again, has gone against us. Let's not go in there. I am for lying low. I'm a physician, said Dr. Hibbison. I mean, there must be, they may be needful. A matter of doorsteps, doorsteps, and they weren't back, were about to enter. The door was open. Street lamp opposite lighted and passage into which he opened was full of men. Some ascended the stairs at the further end, died amid the above, waited for better fortune. All were talking, none listening. Suddenly on upper landing was a great commotion. A man sprung out the door, breaking away from those endeavouring to attain him. Down for the mass of slight and as it came, pushing him aside, frightening him against the wall. On one side, or compelling him to cling on the rail on the other, clutching him by the front, striking him savagely, thrusting him back down the stairs and walking over the floor. He clothed him in disorder, he bowed the hat, his eyes and wild and restless. There's something more terrifying. Then his apparent superhuman strength, his face, smooth shaven, bloodless, his hair, thrust white, as the crowd at the foot of the stairs, having more freedom, fell away to the par, let him pass Harper. Then for Jeanette, Jeanette, he cried. Dobison seized Harper on the front of cut and dragged him back. The man looked at, into their faces without seeing, without seeming to see them. He was praying for the door, down the steps into the street. Away, stout policeman had a fear success in conquering his way down the stairway. Fell at a moment later and pulled it started in pursuit. All the heads in the windows, those of women and children now screaming giants. The stairway being now partly cleared, most of the crowd being having rushed down to the street to observe the flight in pursuit. Dr. Everson mounted the landing, followed by Harper, a door of upper passage. Well, the officer denied them admittance. We're physicians, said the doctor. They passed in. Rumours full of men, dimly seen, crowded about a table. The newcomers edged their way forward and looked over the shoulders of those in the front rank. Upon the table, lower limbs covered with sheep lay a body of a man, brilliantly illuminated by the beam of Mel's eye lantern, held by a policeman standing on their feet. The others, excepting those ahead, the officer himself, all with darkness, the body, Face to body, face showed yellow, pulsive, horrible. 
Her eyes are partly open, upturned, and jaw fallen. Traces of froth defiled. Her lips and cheek, chin and cheeks tall men heavily. A doctor bent over the body, his hand thrust upon his shirt front. He drew it and placed two fingers in the open mouth. This man had been six hours dead, said he. Here's a case for the coroner. He drew a car from his pocket, handed it to the officer, and made his way towards the door. Care the room all out all, said the officer sharply. The body disappeared. As if it had been snatched away, its shifting lantern, he flashed it a beam of light here and there against the face of the crowd. The effect was amazing. The men, blinded, confused, almost terrified, made a tremendous rush at the door, pushing, crowding, and thrumbling over one another as he fled like the hosts of night before the shafts of Apollo. Upon the struggling, trampling mass, trampling mass, the officer poured out his light without pity, without cessation. Caught in the current, Heberson and Harper went out, swept out the room, and cascaded down the stairs into the street. Good God, Doctor! Did I not tell you that Jeanette would kill him? Would kill him? Said Harper as soon as they cleared the crowd. I believe you did, replied the other, without apparent emotion. They walked in silence, on the silence, block of the block against the green. East of the dwelling of the hill tribes showed in silhouette a familiar milk wagon. We stir. The streets of baker men would come soon again upon the scene. Newspaper carrier was broad and in the land. It strikes me, youngster said Peterson, that you and I have been are having too much of the morning air lately. Tulsa, we need a change. Why? What do you say to tour in Europe when? I'm not particular. I should suppose if a four o'clock this afternoon would be early enough. I'm eating a boat, said Harper. Seven years afterwards, the two men sat upon a bench in Madison Square, yielding for any conversation. After another man, been about within him, sometime himself observed, approached and cursely lifted his hat from the locks of his white as he frost said, I beg your pardon, gentlemen, why, why you killed a man by living, going into life? It's best to change clothes with him, and he had first opted to make a break for liberty. Everson and Harper exchanged several glasses. They were obviously amused. The former and asked that the stranger kindly. The eye replied, It's always been my plan. I totally agree with you as you. It's a vet that stopped Sonny, rose and went white. He stared at a man open mouth. He trembled visibly. Ah, said the stranger. See, you're not disposed, doctor. If you cannot treat yourself, Dr. Harper, can you do something for you? I am sure. Who the devil are you, are you? said Harper bluntly. Stranger come nearer, bending to fall forward. Then said in a whisper, I call myself Jarrett sometimes. But I don't mind telling you for our old friendship. I am Dr. William Mincher. Ever she brought Harper at his feet. Mincher, he cried. Ever said that it is true by God. Yes, the stranger won't smile you very vaguely. It's true, no doubt. As they just seem to be trying to recall something and beginning, began humming from the popular air. You've probably forgotten their presence. Look here, Murcher, said the elder of the two. Tell us just what occurred that night to Jarrett, you know. Oh, yes, about Jarrett, said the other. It's odd. I should neglect to tell you. I often, I tell you it's so often, you see, I pretty knew by overhearing him. Talking to himself, he was pretty badly frightened. So I couldn't resist the temptation to come to life and have a bit of fun without him. I couldn't really. It's all right. I suddenly did not think he would take it so seriously. I did uh, not truly. And afterward, well, it's a tough job changing places with him. And then, damn you, you didn't get let me out. Nothing could see the ferocity which these last words were delivered. Both men stepped back in alarm. We? Why? Why, Heberson? Stammered, looking, losing his self-possession. Ali, we had nothing to do with it. Did I say, say you were? Miss Do- Doctor's held bare bone and sharper, replied the man laughing. And my name is Hubberson, yes. And gentlemen, this is Mr. Harper. We formed, replied the former, we shall by laughter. But you're not physician now. We are beat well hung. It, old men, we are for gamblers. And that was truth. Very good profession, very good. Indeed, by the way, I'd hope Sharpers had paid over rich money. I got honest when I called it. I very good, an honorable profession, he repeated thoughtfully. Moving carefully away, but I stick to the old one. I'm a high supreme medical officer. 
Bloomingdale Asylum. I did cure the superintendent.